Live from the House of LeMay Makeup and Dressing Room. Here comes Amber. Stop what you're doing. Here comes Amber. She's just doing what she can. Here comes Amber. Cue the spotlight. Here comes Amber with two drinks in her hand. The matriarch of fashion, secret sewer glasses. You can't look away. Ask her, does she do it? Really nothing to it. She's got that sound on her game. If you have a party, or if you're feeling naughty, call up the house of the maid. Ladies and gentlemen, please turn off all cell phones and get ready for your host, Amber LeMay. But first, won't you please like, share, and subscribe? Come on, it's going to be a great show. You don't want your friends to miss it. So, now what do pillows, ignorant politicians, and gay pride have in common? Hmm. They're all a part of tonight's headlines. News for all my viewers who shop at Walmart to buy your sleeping accessories. Yeah, both of you. Uh, this week, Walmart let the My Pillow Wacko founder, Michael Lindell, know that his products would no longer be on the shelves of America's number one seller of schlocky merchandise. What? Walmart has become woke? I don't think so. I'm thinking that Wally was thinking, number one, this shit ain't selling. Let's find something else these people will buy. And number two, why are people returning this product? Is it as great as Mike says it is? Whatever the reason, if you're looking for a quality pillow, may I suggest the quality products of AmberLive.tv. Our pillows are 100% pre-shrunk polyester, fabric with a linen feel, a hidden zipper, machine washable case, shape retaining 100% polyester insert, of hand wash only. And while the My Pillows are selfishly made by Americans in Wisconsin, we share the wealth around the world with components made in Mexico, Poland, and China. <gasps> but wait, there's more. The pillows at AmberLive.tv come in three sizes, multiple, and two distinct designs. You can get the Amber Life pillow, or if you're in the thinking and drinking frame of mind, shop the Rusty Peen collection. And Unlike Rusty Peen, I won't mind if you sit on my face. Buy yours today. And now back to headlines. Today is Father's Day, and for Herschel Walker, it must have been a very busy day. Walker is the former football star and now the unqualified Republican nominee to be a U.S. Senator from Georgia. Last week at this time, he was campaigning by blaming most of societal ills on absent fathers. Previously, we only knew of Walker's 22-year-old son, Christian. But this week, the Daily Beast, a popular news website, disclosed that Walker is the father of a 10-year-old boy. And a few days later, they added a 13-year-old boy to his family tree. And then a 22-year-old daughter was also announced. All with different mothers. <laughs> the party of family, family values. Happy Daddy's Day. And to add to the mix, the Atlantic... The Atlanta Journal-Constitution debunked previous claims by Walter Walker that he had worked in law enforcement and had been an FBI agent. The extremely sad thing about all of this is that it, when it comes to most GOP voters, this is totally acceptable behavior. Yeah. Now, there's only one more week of Pride Month, and frankly, I'm almost over it. Last week, 31 white right-wing domestic terrorists jammed themselves in a U-Haul and headed to the Idaho Pride celebration. Luckily, someone saw something and did something. 
What could have happened had they not been stopped and arrested? According to Time Magazine, at least 11 different GLBTQ Pride events across the United States have been disrupted by right-wing protest protesters or delayed due to threats of violence. You know, whether it be crashing drag queen story hours, calling in bomb threats, the don't say gay laws being adopted in several states, or open harassment towards members of our community just going about living their lives, this, is, this month has been anything but gay. Until we elect politicians who are interested in protecting all of us, all of us are in danger. But on a brighter note, yesterday was the Stonewall Columbus Pride celebration in Ohio, and one of our loyal viewers sent in these pictures of that city's finest. And that's this week's headlines. Let's bring Russell in to find out what's going on tonight. I don't know. Hey, Amber, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing fine, Russell. Oh, do I think we have a great show tonight, and our oh, regulars are we? already checking in. That's great. <laughs> so I know we've got some new viewers tonight, so tell them the best way to watch. Well, the best way to watch Amber Live is on YouTube, because there you can see us in all full HD glory uh, and so that's the best place to go. And also you'll find that a lot of the regulars are on there commenting so you can talk with them and say hi. And uh, I do want to remind people that we, that we have TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and even our website, amberlive.tv. And there's something different on all of those. And then uh, I do want to tell everybody that if you're out and you can't watch the show uh, later on I have the interviews going online so you can find the Amber Live interviews as a podcast now and you'll enjoy those they're a lot of fun so Amber Live is everywhere you want to be. <laughs> yes, and make sure you like and uh, subscribe so you'll know what's happening here at Amber Live. Every Wednesday, there's a, an Amber chat, and it's usually me talking about whatever's going on. But this past week, I was on the road, and Russell and uh, Dwayne Scott Sioni took over as hosts of Amber Chat. And it was a great show. I listened to it, and uh, it was really <laughs> nice to hear from you. Yeah, so we were happy to know you were uh, listening as you were driving. So, <laughs> oh yes, Wednesday nights around eight fifteen. Stop in. All right, now Russell, one more, uh, one more plug from you. Yes, well, uh, I want to remind everybody about the Boostiers, and these are the people that keep us going and keep us streaming. And if uh, you'd like to become a Boostier, you can see that Venmo there at RJD Pro. You can send your support that way, or there's amberlive.tv. If you go there and look for the support Amber Live button, you'll find a way to donate to Amber Live and help us out. And uh, there are different levels. You can give any amount if you'd like, but $25 or more, and we'll send you a logo sticker. $100 or more, you get a sticker and a magnet. And $200 or more, we'll send you a sticker, a magnet, and a mug. And again, that's at Venmo at RJD Pro. And thank you to all. all right, Russell, do we have a picture? Do we have a picture for the caption tonight? Uh, we do. And uh, the picture for the caption, hang on one second, is actually loading at the moment. Um, <laughs> and But I have it ready now. Here it is. Tonight's caption Ooh. is for this picture. If you've got a funny caption about that picture, send it in in the comments. Let Jack know. And at the end of the show, we'll bring up the funniest ones and have a good giggle about them. So, oh, I'm, sure, I'm sure we will. All right. So I let's think, go right to the, the guests of, the, of tonight's show, Russell. Oh, do we have a lot of guests tonight? We have uh, a great selection of updates about previous guests that uh, is going to include one live update. We have a guest coming back in. Uh, and that's the absolutely amazing Charles Bush, who uh, has been on two episodes of our show because he's had so much of a story to tell. And then we have uh, the outstanding Julie Gold here tonight, who uh, you are, if, if you didn't immediately know the name, as you will immediately know the song, and that's From a Distance, and that is Julie Gold's work. And uh, she's going to tell you all about how that came into being and how it changed her life. So, and then of course we have Dwayne Scott Cierney and Rusty Peen and Rocco coming in. So it's going to be a packed show. Let's get started. Show. Let's get All started. right, All right. Oh, I'm out of here and have a great show. Uh, thank you, Russell. Yes, so happy to introduce to you Julie Gold. Julie, come on in. Hi, Hi Julie. Sir. 
Now, I, I just want to let everyone remind everyone that you are a Grammy Award winner for writing the song from a distance. Oh, oh, you even have oh girl. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. And, and we're gonna talk about that. We, we got you talking in three different segments tonight. So if you want to hear about from a distance, hold on. We'll be talking about that soon. But right now, I'd like to ask you. How did you start in your music? What's your musical history? How did you start saying, hey, I'd like to write a song? I'm lucky enough to have seen what I wanted and gone for it. That's it. Uh, you know, the first time I heard a song, I wanted to be part of it. It's, it's that simple. I just took to it. So how old were you? Yeah, it was a plastic guitar. And I would swing on the swings in the backyard and make up songs to my cat and to the birdies. And uh, by, by first grade, my parents got a piano and I took piano lessons. And uh, my family took us to Broadway before we could barely walk. And also I saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show in 1964. And that was life changing. So, you know, I had- uh, uh, on, on TV or were you in the audience? No, I wasn't in the audience. I was only uh, just, eight years old, but but it was in my parents' bedroom, and we watched Ed Sullivan. And you know, I have an older brother, so he listened to the radio, and his taste in music influenced me. And uh, we had a lot of music in my house at all times. I was fully immersed in music, and that's what I became. But when did you start writing songs? Um, you said you made some up on the swing. When did you start writing them and you know, putting them down on paper and yeah. taking it uh, seriously? Well, there was this really cool kid in junior high school, and his name was Michael Kirkbride. And even for high junior high, he had sideburns and he wore a leather jacket, and he took it seriously too. So he would bring me poetry. And I would try to sit at the piano and write. So I would say that, you know, in junior high was when I really gave it uh, a try. And I actually wrote something uh, in junior high. And it's still a song that I would do to this day. Uh, oh, how, how nice is that? That is terrific. All right, so you graduate from high school. What happened after high school? After high school, I, I went to college. I'm, I'm born and bred in Philadelphia. So I went to Girls High and then I went to Temple. And in Temple, uh, I started playing in bars to support myself. And I never missed a class. I never missed a test. But I would be playing until 2 o'clock in the morning and then driving home, unloading my equipment. And uh, I would be coming to New York to do what they call open mic nights. So, you know, you, you get up and you do one or two songs in the middle of the night. But in those days, in the 70s, there were actually agents in the audience who literally were looking and they would give you their card. And all around me in these dark, smoky, phone ringing rooms, um, I saw such talent and it was so inspiring. And so, you know, I finished college and like the minute I graduated, I moved to New York and, and struggled to make it. So what kind of songs did you play in these bars? Was it a piano bar? Were you with a band? or what? No, what I'm, I'm, not, I'm not good enough to accompany anyone or to take requests. But I was able to play the songs that I loved. Motown and Burt Bacharach and Hal David and uh, Todd Rundgren and Carol King and all the songs of my uh, you know, formative years. So those are the songs that I played. And then I would integrate my own songs into it. And uh, over time, I had enough songs to do only my own songs. I wouldn't dare sing another person's song now because I'm not a good enough singer or player. But if you're the writer, you can get away with being a, a mediocre singer and player. So you would just play, you wouldn't sing, except for your sing. songs. Oh, honey, I sang. Yeah. You know, if you believe in what you're doing, then it comes through confidence and belief and, and a goal. So, you know, I wasn't trying to be some great singer or some ingenue. Uh, I was just trying to be honest at the piano, which is still what I try to do. After, after Temple, what happened? Where, yeah. where, where'd you go? What'd you do? I moved to New York city. And uh, in fact, from coming up, to New York from Philadelphia, I found my first manager gave me his card and signed me. And his goal 
was to get me a record deal. And in those days, that was what everyone was after, being signed to a major record label. And that label would then promote you and you would tour and you would sell records. And, you know, that would be your career. And he did not secure that record deal for me. So, you know, after one year, you know, my first year in New York, I had a manager. I had an apartment. I had a car. I had a gig in the neighborhood, five nights a week, cocktail hour. So I was free at night. And I was free during the day. And they let me eat. It was a beefsteak Charlie's upstairs. So I had free dinners every night. I was made. My manager couldn't get me the record deal. And he dropped me after a year. My car was vandalized and towed away. The bar closed. <laughs> and, and I literally had nothing. Uh, I, I really had nothing except the fact that I knew that I wasn't ever giving up. And so, you know, 11 or 12 years later, thank God I had my success. But it, it was it was a long, hard uh, road. Fun. I, I wouldn't trade it for one minute because never once was I discouraged. Now, I never thought, uh oh, I'm going to give this up. Never, 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 never. You were doing something you like to do. Yeah. You were making a living from it. So yeah. I, I agree with that. That, that is so terrific. Um, who, who did you meet along in those 12 years before you got your break? Okay. Um, who, who were some of the people that were you were running around with? The same people uh, that were playing in the same smoky phone ringing bars are all my peers and are mostly still my dear friends. And that would include Sean Colvin, Lucy Kaplansky, Christine Lavin, Cliff Eberhardt, John Gorka, Mary Chapin Carpenter, uh, who else? The Roaches, but they were a, a, a league ahead of us already. But, you know, I'm still friends with most of them. We were all dreamers. Some of them got signed to major deals. Some of them toured the country. Some of them gave it up. But, you know, it was magical. It was magical. It was dark nights where you just get up and do one song and, and, and hope to be discovered. You know, and all these years later, I still hope to be discovered. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do you create a song? Um, what, what's, what's, what's your creative process in developing a song? For me, it's always been something that I, I want to say or I need to say. And so I make myself sit at the piano every day and play. I feel that, you know, as a musician, you owe it to music. You owe it to yourself to practice every day. If you don't, then you're not, you're serious. You know, you, you, you must, it's like if you're an athlete, you can't think about being an athlete. You have to train. So I, I force myself to practice every day. And sometimes if I have something important to say, I sit at the piano with a little bit of a song lyric. And fortunately, if I put a great little lyric in front of me, it usually comes uh, with me. You mentioned your piano. Yeah. I've, I've heard about a magic piano. Tell this, me that story. This is it. Well, I, I live in a one bedroom apartment. This is not, you know, uh, so I live in one bedroom, but right now I'm sitting between two pianos. This is the piano of my childhood. And there across the way is a, is a Steinway. It's a five foot, ten and a half Steinway. Um, but for my 30th birthday, my parents sent this piano to me. This is my childhood piano. It, it sat alone in my house in Philadelphia and nobody played it. And I had an electric piano at my house in New York, my little apartment. And it was a hideous, hideous marriage. It was like being married to the wrong person. You know, you had to stay married out of desperation, but it, you hated it. And so this electric piano was horrifying. And for my 30th birthday, I said, please, you know, nobody's playing it. Can you send it up to me? And they did without hesitation. So uh, at the time, I was a secretary at HBO. You know, I wasn't making a living at music for those 11 years. I, I had to get jobs. I had to get real jobs. So uh, I worked at HBO for seven or eight years, and uh, I took the day off, and I saw this piano come off the truck, get infused with magic, be taken to my apartment, be taken to the place where I thought it would go, and then the workman told me you can't play it for a day because it's ice cold. It was December of 1985. And so I slept 
and walk. Steep ladder, above the ladder, above the piano, all night long. I looked down the piano, and, and next day I came down the ladder and, and from a distance just sort of poured out of me. So it is a magical piano. Oh my goodness. So that was your inspiration for that. Yes. Okay. Um, now we're going to close out this segment. We're going to talk about from a distance in our next segment, okay. but um, we're going to play now a song called America. Tell me about America. Uh, you know, I'm a child of the sixties. So, so much of what I write is based on everything I saw growing up and, and the huge effect it had on me. Plus my mother um, is an, was an immigrant. So, you know, she came from Russia for freedom and she instilled that in us that you know there's no place like america and and i so so believe it and and that's all that the inspiration behind america is all right well let's watch this clip and we'll be back talking to you in just a few minutes thank Back. you julie great seeing you great seeing play you. it please russell <laughs> I know what's right And I know I'm not alone And the people who believe the things I do Live here in America It's a garden What was Eden then will blossom once again, blossom in America. America, America, America. We have more of Julie Gold coming up. But first, some Amber Live updates. A few weeks ago, Debbie Wildman returned to Amber Live to talk about her new album, I'm Still Here, celebrating Judy Garland's 100th birthday. This was to be topped off with a tour of the United States starting in California on June 10th. However, due to a passport snafu, now I told her not to mention my name. She wasn't able to leave London on schedule and had to postpone the California gigs. However, on Monday, tomorrow, she'll be appearing in Fort Lauderdale on, and on Wednesday in Orlando on Saturday at Carnegie Hall. Yes, Carnegie Hall. And then a week from today in Provincetown. Check out her tour dates and how to get her music at her website. Now, back in August of 2020, we brought you TikTok and YouTube funny person, Walter Masterson. Here's a clip from that show. Um, so I've been an actor for years. And then, you know, when COVID hit, there wasn't, there's nothing to do. I got on TikTok to create a bunch of characters. And that's, you know, that's how it started. I was like, you know, let me make a conservative character um, that's pretending to be conservative, that's being hyperbolic. Like, I always love, like, Stephen Colbert or, like, Sasha Baron Cohen. I, you know, I, I love what they do. So I've always sort of envied how they do things. And because Black Lives Matter wants to get rid of Oreo cookies 
No, those are black. Police. No, are they, the Oreo cookies, Nabisco, Ships Ahoy, all of it. There. They're going to take you straight to Bellevue. There'll be somebody there to give you medicine that you really need. Go, get into the get into the end. Hillary Clinton is working to try and take away your Oreo cookies. Now that I mess with people on the street as that conservative character, I have like a whole new level of respect for people that do that. It's hard to get people to open up and get like angry, you know, and, and get angry enough to talk to me and stuff. So it's it takes brains to be stupid. It does. It does. <laughs> well, Walter took his act on the road and was in Washington, D.C. on that infamous January 6th, as evidenced in this week's congressional hearing. Here is what the president wrote in his 2.24 p.m. tweet while the violence at the Capitol was going on. And here is what the rioters thought. Nothing but a traitor, and he deserves to burn with the rest of them. So this, so I, this all escalated after Pence. What, what happened? Did Pence, 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 didn't, yeah. Pence didn't do what we he, wanted? Pence voted against Trump. Okay, and that's when all this started? Yep, that's when we marched on the Capitol. <laughs> Great job, Walter. All right. And now to give us an in-person update, please welcome back Tony Award nominee, Charles Bush. Hey, Charles. Well, hello there. So is, is, is that for real? That yes. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Would I lie to you, Charles? <laughs> you seem so cute when you had him on. Who knew? <laughs> oh, I'm terribly oh, disappointed. Okay. He's working. All right, Charles, the last time you were on, and again, I'd like to repeat what Russell said, we had you on two episodes because you were so fantastic to talk to and we learned so much about you. And you were talking about your latest movie, The Sixth Reel. Give us an update on that. Yes, my my, my latest motion picture. Yes, my return to the screen. Um, yeah, it's this movie uh, that, that I uh, co-wrote and co-directed with my longtime colleague, Carl Andrus. And I'm I acted along with this really fantastic cast of people, uh, Margaret Cho and Tim Daly, and uh, and all these wonderful Broadway people who, uh, because of the pandemic, they were available and and, and thrilled to, to work. And it's a, 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 a kind of it's a contemporary um, comedy caper movie uh, set in the uh, the milieu of. Um, uh, old moot classic film collectors and, and dealers and all sorts of hijinks and soup. Anyway, it's, it's been on the um, uh, film festival circuit. It's going to be regularly distributed and released, you know, theatrically sometime in the... Uh, oh, hello? Yeah, I thought I was... I missed that. Uh, sometime sometime anyway, it's, when... It's, it's coming out, like, regularly, like, you know, in theaters and everything later in the year. But at the moment... Uh, on uh, it's going to be a frameline LGBT film festival uh, in San Francisco on June 24th at the Castro Theater, and and then avail you know there's like a window that's available for streaming through through them. I think it's June 24th through uh, June 30th. So I'm very excited because I, I I love Frameline. It's one of the the best uh, LGBT film festivals and. That's where we first uh, basically premiered Psycho Beach Party and uh, and Die Mommy Die as well. So it's it's uh, it feels like a good omen. Well, let's watch the trailer for the sixth reel. Okay. Hey, Gerald, I'm here. Gerald, your friend appears to have been dead for at least 24 hours. Would you believe that this is the fourth time I've discovered a dead body? Is there anything else you can tell me that's pertinent? I am an expert in the world of cinema memorabilia. I'll be the one to assess my uncle's estate. Old copies of TV Guide? It's a sickness! Your uncle is more of a hoarder than a collector. London After Midnight is the holy grail of lost films. <gasps> Jimmy, are you all right? This 
reel of film could very well be your death warrant. Can we watch it? Are you insane? There are people out there who would gladly slit your throat to possess 10 minutes of London after midnight. It's at the top of my list of lost films that I would without conscience kill to see. Jimmy Nichols! Jimmy, I believe those vampires are calling Don't pay you. attention to them. Jimmy! Let's make a run for it! You cannot escape us! You have it! You have it! You have it! Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! The film has to be sold and out of our hands as swiftly as possible. Congratulations on the cinematic find of the century. Are you free for dinner tomorrow night? It's gone. I can't believe you told him everything. You are a vile, despicable human being. To protect this film, I would sleep with a lot worse than you. The Museum of Modern Art is meeting me here tomorrow to personally pick up the movie. Helen and I have devised a foolproof plan. We shall strive to keep this as simple and undramatic as possible. We're looking for Jimmy Nichols. Don't know him. Never met him. Check. Bring the package downstairs. Check. Hello. Get Max, take that from me. Jimmy. Shouldn't we be going up 8th Avenue? We will be taking you to a different destination. Can somebody please tell me what is going on? Huh? The film must be destroyed. No! Rumble into death. I think the four of you have seen too many movies. Shut your hole. The story begins in the 1960s. Oh, well, must we go back to the 60s? I'm on a diuretic. Shut your hole, Doris. I'm into it. <laughs> Thank Hello, you for the entire trailer. That's so sweet of you. Well, now, what I, I took personal enjoyment in that because um, just a few weeks ago, Russell and I had the privilege to uh, be taking a tour of your apartment or your, your home, and a lot of the interior scenes from that movie took place in your abode. Oh, no, 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 no. It, 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 it looks like that now. <laughs> they, uh, um, my apartment's a little, a little too grand for that because he uh, <laughs> he's really down and out, the character I played. No, but we, the uh, art director and set designer, uh, took uh, a lot of a lot of crap from my apartment, and uh, that was it. That was it. That's yeah, what you told yeah, the last time. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. All right. Well, how exciting! So it it um it's going to be streamed on Frameline. It's going to be released to theaters. Do you see a wide um, release of the no, film? No, that's a little movie. I I think it'll probably be uh, you know just in, in uh, theatrically in New York and. Um, but it'll be, you know, you know, streamable and available in every other format, like 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 a regular movie. So <laughs> right. I don't, you know, I don't want to be, you know, lead it on, lead you to think it's, you know, you know, in, in open opens in three thousand theaters, you know. <laughs> I understand. It doesn't work that way. Um, anyway. not, you not you told us that you write. You, you told us that you write something every day. What are you currently writing, and what do you see the next? Thing coming out that we can know about. Well, I, I've I've really been in a good kind of a good creative place. I have to say, you know, um, uh, well, I've been working on it for for years, honey, just years on a on a book on a, on a memoir, you know, and I, I just took forever, and and I never had any idea if anybody was ever going to want to publish it or, or not or or what. But I I f uh, finished it and sold to a, a wonderful company called Ben Bella. And and it'll be out this year too. And so I'm just finishing the uh, rewrites from. I got some very good notes from the editor, and, and uh, he's a very smart fellow. And so uh, it's making making it better. So you know, so I I'm just busy. You know, my life hasn't really changed that much in the pandemic because uh, you know I lead the rather gr rather grim solitary existence of a writer. You know, and most of the time I'm just uh, you know, I write every day, and you know, I'm just sort of sitting there at the it's um, just what's a challenge for me in general is just, you know, that, yeah, you have to get up and, you know, and move around and uh, you don't want to get secretary spread, do you? No. <laughs> I think it's a little too late for that. <laughs> but, uh, Charles, thank you so much. And when your memoir comes out, I hope you'll come back and talk to us about it. I'd love it. So good to see you. Nice seeing you, Charles. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That is so cool. All right. All right. We're getting back to Julie Gold for part two of Julie Gold. And um, this is the song that she wrote.
right? All right, so uh, we'll... From a distance, the world looks blue and green And the snow-capped mountains white From a distance, the ocean meets the stream And the eagle takes to flight Let's bring Julie back in. Julie, come on in. Oh, my gosh. That was so, oh, you singing your own work. All right. You said that you wrote that song on that piano that's behind you. That was the first song you wrote as an adult on that piano? No, I listened. When I worked at home in Philadelphia, I wrote on this piano. I had a million songs before from a distance. But it's one of the first songs. It's the first song I wrote on the piano in New York. Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. That's, that's what I was getting at. Yes, yes, yes. yes. What, was the what was the inspiration of that song? You know, I had scribblings of the lyrics on my notepad that said Julie Gold HBO. So it wasn't 100% that first seeding that, that I wrote the whole thing. But again, you know, I have uh, been very affected by all that has gone on for my entire life. And uh, I also have... a uh, you know, without being creepy or anything, you know, I happen to have a strong connection with God. And so, you know, I at, that, at my desk is where I wrote, God is watching us, God is watching us, God is watching us. At my desk as a secretary at HBL. So it just sort of came together with very little rewriting. As a child of the 60s, it's an outpouring of everything. How did it get from your magic piano yeah. to Bette Midler? Yeah, it's a fantastic story. Um, you know, I mentioned Christine Lavin as one of the friends who I met in the 70s uh, in the smoky, noisy bars. And she was playing at a club down on McDougal Street here called the uh, Speakeasy. The Speakeasy literally was like a Greek restaurant. It literally had spinning meat in the window. And yet that's where we all thought we would be discovered in, in a restaurant that had spinning meat in the window. And not only that, but it was mostly a folk club. And this is absolutely a true story. Yes, there was a piano in the basement. The piano had about, it was all cigarette burns, which is people used to put their cigarette on the keys and it would burn down. All out of tune, missing notes. And I would say to the owner, Joseph, can't you do something? about the piano and he literally once said to me what are you talking about i just had it painted yeah so they a lot of the folk clubs don't have great understanding of what a piano player needs uh, christine lavin was performing there and she said bring me 10 copies of from a distance i would like to pass them around in the business because i had sent it far and wide to all of my contacts and it was rejected far and wide which is the story of all our, our careers rejection is the name of the game it doesn't mean they're right the people who are rejecting you but it's the name of the game the answer is you can't give up and you can't believe them so i gave her 10 cassettes and within a few weeks, yeah cassettes. within a few weeks one of the biggest djs here in new york played it on k-rock vin skelsa and I had a call from the great singer, Nancy Griffin, who died last August. And she became like a sister to me. But Nancy Griffith received it from Christine Lavin. Nancy recorded it. And Nancy sang it all over the world. And from that, it became known. And Bette Midler had just had a hit with a song called The Wind Beneath My Wings. That was from a movie called Beaches. 
A year after that, they were looking for a song for her, and they they knew of From a Distance, and the uh, the music critic of the New York Times recommended it to her oh. musical director. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Now, have you met? Been in contact with Beth Midler? Do you ever talk to her or what? Uh, any relationship know, there? I wish, but no, you know, it, it's about being a songwriter and there being a singer and being fortunate enough in my life to have hooked some of my best songs into some of the greatest, greatest singers of all time. Do I wish that, yes, in fact, Beth, come on over. Do I wish she was sitting right here with me now? And got right on. Yes. Do, do I wish that I was having lunch with her tomorrow? Yes. Do, do I wish that I've ever had lunch with her? Yes. And I haven't. And yet I owe her everything. And I love her more than words can ever say. And I owe her more than I could ever, ever give. That really disappoints me because I wrote a song along with our friend Jack about it's called Sweaty Balls. And my goal is to have Bette Midler sing that song, Sweaty Balls. It just sounds like a song that she would sink her teeth in. Well, or don't, something. Don't, don't give up on trying. You never know. Sweaty balls. Okay. So you said, um, uh, tell me some of the other people who have recorded that song. That song, uh, let's see, Judy Collins. Uh, the Birds, Kathy Matea, uh, Cliff Richard, uh, who else? Those are probably uh, Patty LaBelle. Patty LaBelle has sung it at Live at the Apollo. Um, but, you know, boys' choirs and girls' choirs and every language imaginable. Oh, it's, it's so inspirational. Um, and it's also, um, did NASA? Play it once or twice. Oh, yes. Well, when the ver at, remember I told you my mother is a Russian immigrant. So imagine this: the very first time the United States and Russia hooked up at what's called the Mir space station in outer space. Their wake-up call was from a distance. Did Listen, you know what's going to happen? No, I don't know anything that's going to happen. You, you know, Barbara Boxer recited it into the congressional record. Uh, so that's permanent uh, forever. It's in the congressional record for, for all of history. Uh, during the first Persian Gulf War, it was the most requested song on Saudi band radio. And I'm pretty much, you know, a, a pacifist. I have all sorts of military awards around my apartment. It's quite, quite humbling. Um, Nancy Griffith first sang it in Belfast. And she would call me at my desk in HBO. And she'd say, Julie, I, I just sang your song. And, and Protestants and Catholics were embracing and weeping. You, you, you don't know what you have here. And, and that was just the very, very beginning of it. And now I have stuff like this. I'll just give one second so you can see. Hold on. I mean, who has something like this? Teddy Bear to sing Sweaty Balls. <laughs> <laughs> You should call the company and definitely have him do sweaty balls. I think, I think. <laughs> uh, we got one more segment with you, Julie, but we're going to close out this uh, segment with your song, New World. Tell oh, us about New World. Thank you. Well, it's funny. When you said you were doing that, I can't remember if I wrote it right after gay marriage passed or right after Obama was nominated. I'm not sure what, but it was a, such an inspiration of love and, and hope and positivity and you see those the the video that you showed of america and the video you're about to show of uh, uh the new world i made them with christine lavin who i've mentioned now all through the show but she brings out the best in my work and she makes fantastic videos and i feel that this video just so much captures the spirit of the song and i'm so happy that that's the song that you've chosen to share really thank you oh, oh, oh you got some great positive positive songs i really love it so let, let's watch a new world and we'll be back to talk to you in a few minutes thank you okay. joy thank you Get ready for the new world. Get ready for the new world. Get ready for the new world. Come in just 
more with Julie Gold. But now let's bring in our resident historian, Dwayne Scott Searney. Dwayne, come on in. So, Phil. What's in your attic? <laughs> but it is. There you are, Dwayne Scott Searney. Hey, Amber, I made it. It's that walk down the or, attic every time. Oh, or I, I hear that your nickname is Dewey. So yeah. <laughs> Dewey and I go back and I'm her Dewey and it doesn't get any better than that. Isn't she lovely? And Charles, oh, oh my gosh, these artists. I mean, we're all, we're all, we're all so blessed. Uh, yes. You know, from a distance, <laughs> the world looks blue and green. And Russell has helped me bring this earth to you tonight. So Russell, let's see a first video. I love these globes from the 1930s, and this is a perfect example of why. Uh, of course, this is an airplane globe. You can see this great heavy chrome base uh, and stand. Um, this is a paper globe, it's actually cardboard. Uh, when you're looking at something like this uh, to purchase, always be looking at the condition of the chrome, uh, how the, the globe itself affixes uh, to the base and the condition of the paper. And there's always going to be wear. Again, this is a paper over cardboard globe. Uh, it's almost 100 years old, so condition is, there's always going to be a bit of an issue there. But if it's mostly intact, it's a winner. Little information. Now, where did you pick, where, where did you pick that globe up? Where did you find oh, that? Gosh, or? Here and there. My, tra my, my travels. <laughs> um, next. So, yeah, so this is kind of from the machine age to the space age. So the next one is a, is a light-up globe, and this is pretty cool. Again, thank you, Russell, for making this happen. Magic. Now for something equally fabulous and yet very different from what we just saw. This is a, a 1920s, 1930s uh, antique fish globe, and I want to show this to you lit. Um, it's actually a glass globe, which is... Just shocking that it's even survived this long. And we're going to play a little magic here and hope this works, because I just want you to see the, the full effect. Isn't this cool? Worth my goofiness? <laughs> <laughs> so cool. One more, some more, please. Yeah, we got a couple of them. So this is one of my favorites, because we all love Buck Rogers and the Promise of the Future. So this is the UFO globe. This is a, another example of that um, kind of flying saucer, spaceship-inspired 1930s Art Deco design. Again, uh, heavy chrome base with the globe uh, handle to it. Again, paper, paper globe in really nice condition. Uh, they do repro these, so you know, be on the lookout. Um, and really the best way we, you can tell is by either dating the globe itself and the paper globe and, of course, the weight of the base. But isn't this fun? So where were these made? Do you have any idea? Was there a globe factory somewhere? Oh, gosh. Well, actually, a lot of them were made in, in Chicago. These are all, yeah, these are all American products. Um, sure, for just in, in uh, casting. Actually, a lot of automotive places would do this on the side and like to make these castings. 
Um, but of course, you know, it's you know, it's educational, and it's educational tonight because we're all we're all learning something. Ah, so so we see clothes, but what about bookend? What about? How about a pair of brass globe bookends from 1963? These are actually marked Helium for the Space Age, National Helium Corporation. And of course, we had to throw in a first edition of Rosemary's Baby, just to get your attention. <laughs> oh, the best. Uh, somehow, I expected one of your books to be uh, oh, well, clamped in there. We'll be talking about that soon because one of them just came out. But wait, there's more. <laughs> oh, right. This is my favorite. We're going to send it out this one with uh, an Ohio art. This might look familiar to many of you. Here we go. And last but certainly not least, this Ohio art metal globe from the 1960s. What's really cool about this is check out the base. It's the signs of the zodiac. It's a horoscope base. And you get a free cat who happens to be Pisces. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. All right. <laughs> now, Ohio Arch, do you know what else Ohio Arch made? What? The Etch a Sketch. Ah, yeah, yeah. Big, big, big toy manufacturer. And you remember when I read your palm on Halloween? <laughs> I guess we're not talking about that. That's the, <laughs> that's the exercise version. No, that's that wrong. Movies, no. <laughs> Getting flashbacks. <laughs> well, Do you have any more globes for us? Pardon? Do you have any more globes for us? No, we wanted to bring it. And the cat sends it off. <laughs> All right, very good. Well, thank you very much, Dwayne Scott and thank you for hooking us up with Julie Gold. That's great. Thank you. The best. All right. What's in your attic? <laughs> Let's bring back in Julie Gold for segment number three to uh, find out what's happening now. Hey, Julie. Again, hi again. You know, uh, Charles Bush has a star in front of the uh, Lucille Lortel Theater right here on Christopher Street. And so I take it very seriously to make sure that that star is always well preserved. He said, you know, if there's ever leaves on it or gum or cigarette butts. So it's, I'm in charge of his star in front of the Lucille Lortel. I just wanted to say, and knowing people so talented, you know, like Billy and like Charles, that, that's been the light of my life meeting people and now you you know it was just a beautiful illuminating journey to meet such wonderfully colorful and talented people who are, who are far from run of the mill there you're how true how true do you get residual checks or do you get checks every year for uh, from from a distance i do i do okay they're actually called royalty checks Loyalty. That's what. That's what it is. Yes. 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 In my day, fortunately, I got in to luck at a time when income depended on radio play and record sale. Period. It was very easy to tabulate, and and a big seller was easy to tabulate. Now, with the onset of Spotify and Rhapsody and YouTube and all of the uh, streaming uh, platforms. Income has changed for songwriters. The, the, the whole field has collapsed financially. And, and you, a person really can't make a living anymore unless they get, you know, some sort of a promotion or a Super Bowl ad or a movie soundtrack or something. It's changed. Now, the thing is, you never want to base your life on the potential of earning. I don't think. I think you should base it on luck. But earning a living is very important. And it's also an incentive. And the incentive has gone because pop music, rock music, music has changed. And people who are writers are no longer uh, appreciated or uh, earning what they used to earn. What are you working on now? What do you see as a, do you have something in the process that you're working on? Or do you just continually just pump them out, pump out the songs? As a writer, I, I write. And I hope and pray that I always do. I hope and pray 
that I always find inspiration in simple everyday things, which I'm a part of the world. And I love being a part of the world. I walk on the Hudson River, not on the Hudson River, but I walk beside the Hudson River every day of my life. And I see something beautiful every day of my life. And I hope and pray to be inspired every day of my life. Do I write something every day of my life? Hardly, hardly. I, I hardly write, but I practice every day. And I see it as a fishing expedition. So I love fishing. And every now and again, I reel in a fish. And that's what I hope for. Well, how exciting. Thank you so much. We're going to close out your segment and your visit tonight with the song Love is Love. Let us, let us know about that. Thank you. What did you say? Let us. Uh, did you say what, what about that? Yeah, yeah. Tell me about Love is Love. Well, again, you know, I actually w walk to Chelsea Piers, which is my gym, every day up the river. And uh, in 2011, I think, I wrote that song. And I, I the opening line of it is, you know, I had a... I had a revelation as I walked by the river and the current ran through me and I felt it renew me and a voice from above told me love is love is love. And I got to my gym and I literally asked for a piece of paper because I knew it was good and I wrote it down. It's a very inspired song about love and that's what all my music is about, really, love. It is, you know, you're just such a positive um, influence in your music. And I really, really appreciate that. I see a lot of pride emphasis, um, emphasis um, in your song. So thank you very much for that. Happy Pride to you, Julie. And uh, we, we, we will talk again. So I thank you so much for joining us tonight here at Amber Live. And let's close out with Love is Love. Thank you. Love is love is love, love is love is love, is love is love is love is love, love is love is love, is love is love. I had a revelation as I walked by the river and the current ran through me and I felt it renew me and a voice from above told me love is love is love. And my life felt lighter as the sun got brighter And I kept on going with the joy in knowing I was part of the heart And love is love is love Love is love is love, love is love is love, is love is love out all of Julie Gold's music. It is so inspirational. It's so great to listen to. Thank you so much, Julie, for sharing your Sunday night with us tonight. Well, tonight is also Father's Day, as mentioned earlier. Uh, Amber, Russell? before you go there, uh, you skipped ahead earlier, and we didn't get to show the captions again. So I wanted to make sure people got a chance to uh, send in their captions. So if you've got a funny caption for this photo, Send it in to Jack. I don't think he's gotten any yet. So uh, if you got a good caption, send it in. Uh, we want to hear from you. <laughs> so <laughs> there's just so much. I wanted to make sure we got everything in, and obviously we didn't. <laughs> so so, uh, so right. now we did. <laughs> All right. Now yes. Okay. On. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So it is Father's Day, and we have a special Father's Day message from Rusty P. Yo, this here is Rusty Peen from the Beaver Pond Guns and Tackle Society, and our mission is to arm more drag queens because a loaded drag queen is a safe drag queen, dude. Dude, happy fucking Father's Day. It's too bad Pappy Peen ain't here on account of that time he went out for smokes and never came back. That and he died of a heart attack while he was driving the cigarette delivery truck. Pappy Peen, it was his life dream to be a disgraced scientist, but they kicked him out of that fucking Poison Ivy College fucking dirt mouth, and he only got to be a disgrace. Pappy Peen was a man who wrote more books than he read. He wrote more on chemistry. He rewrote the fucking periodic table of elements. He had fucking oxycodone, chloroform, Platinum, vodka, 
Rumchadium, Vibranium, Unobtainium, Erbium, Lead, Zeppelin, Dolomite, Wolframite, Poutine, Uranium, and Fireball, dude! Dude, the fucking thing is trapped in a fucking bottle. Didn't you want to get out of there, bud? That's the shit right there, bud. There's three laws of thermodynamics. Pappy Peen had just one. Rusty, don't set your fucking face on fire. Biology. Pappy Peen could explain where babies come from in just five words. From peen pods. Shut up. Physics. Rusty, you better learn how to drop kick a fucker in the fucking throat before he drop kicks you, dude. Nuclear reactions. Rusty, get back here with my smokes before I go fucking nuclear. That's it for Think and Drink and Father's Day edition. If you're a father, I hope your fucking peen pods are leaving you alone. You know? Russell, let's show that uh, captioned picture one more time because we got a few more minutes. We got to talk to Rocco, so uh, we people can uh, submit that picture. Yep, if you have a comment uh, for this caption, the <laughs> Popeyes. Lucy Bell always brags about her her love of Popeyes. I wonder if that's why. All right, we have another. I hope a Father's Day message from um, the daddy of them all, Rocco Zamboni. Rocco, come on in. I don't know, Amber. You got that jalapenos and chicken poopers? What is that? I, I, I don't know. It's a southern thing, I believe. I'm not sure. Yeah, so, it sounds helpful, right? So, so Rocco, father, tell me about what? How was your Father's Day? Did you spend yeah, time with Rocco Jr.? Yeah, Rocco Jr., that other girl thing. We had a good time, you know? We were doing some uh, reminiscing about past good times we've had we played mario odyssey it was good you know let me tell you though if you're gonna give your dad a gift you know most people give gifts like golf balls uh underwear a tie things like that let me tell you what dads don't like it's golf balls underwears and ties and fishing <laughs> all right you want to give your dad something good Give him a jackhammer or, you know, one of those real dolls. Those things are good. Or maybe a bridge. Just say, Dad, I gave you that bridge. And your dad's going to be like, hey, put, me, put a sign up there with my name on it. And everyone's got to give me money to cross that bridge. I'm just thinking of stuff all the time. What can I say? What are you up to? Oh, um, about 5'10". That's hilarious. <laughs> so Rocco, we haven't talked in a couple of weeks. Uh, summer is you know uh, this week is the you know the days start getting shorter, you know. Um yeah, what that's full summer thing. do you have? Uh I don't know. It's uh, everything's kind of crazy over here, you know. I'm just hoping I get to the beach, see some chicks in bikinis. You know, what kind of tricks like do you wear? What, 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 what is your swimming attire? What does it look like? Me? I wear a suit and tie with my swimming trunks. <laughs> trunks? Trunks. trunks. Yeah. yeah. No, um, I go I go full out there. Full, what is it? Full Monty. Ooh, well, that's, you go to those special beaches then. Yeah, no, I go to public beaches. I get yelled at a lot, but. I, I bet you do. You know. um, had you been celebrating Pride Month in any way? Yeah, I watch TV and I see on the logos they got the rainbow thing there that says Pride. And I'm like, all right. I don't know how else to support it except say, you guys are doing good. I'm here to support you in any way possible. You know, I went to the Met game yesterday. Everything was rainbows, rainbows, rainbows everywhere. It was pretty cool. The Mets win yesterday? They won. They sure did. 
All right, I can't hear I, you for some reason. What the hell's going on? I, I don't know. Well, Rocco, thank you so much for stopping in. Happy Father's Day, even though I know you're not a father, you're an uncle. Damn um, right. So, uh, can't prove it. <laughs> no, no, can't do that. Well, thank you so much, Rocco. We'll talk to you next week. All right, have a good time, all right? Yes, yes. All right. Hey, Jack, let's bring Jack in. Hi, Jack. Hey, Amber. Good show tonight. Oh, my goodness. There was so much going on. Yeah. <laughs> and then lots of right. goals so, just about practicing and just having good habits on creativity. Definitely. Just so her positive attitude and um, that, that was very, very inspirational. So what do we have? Any uh, caption? I've got three. three. Two of them are from Johnny. <laughs> so kicking it off he says we got your hot peckers here got <laughs> yes. Cooper's peckers and and peen i guess i don't know yes peen jalapenos <laughs> uh kim says if that's what popeyes are selling i am out oh kim get get some adventure in your life <laughs> yeah. cajun style yeah. and uh Finally, Johnny says, this is where Johnny Cash came up with that ring of fire. <laughs> good one, Johnny. That is a very, very good one. So, Jack, do you have anything new coming up in your life that you'd like to share with us? Well, I have some news regarding our friend Rusty. Are you aware that he has an album out right now? Oh, yes. Uh, Russell, do we have time to show that clip? It's only a minute long. It just seems longer. Yo! Are you ready to rock, dude? Get ready for the music experience of the century with Pure Peen. Now that's what I call peen. Rusty Peen sings the timeless hits in one awesome collection. Watch that fucker out. With these timeless classics, you'll be singing them at your next trailer park bonfire. And the horse said, dude, the odds are 50 to 1. I'm a long shot, but you should fucking take it, bud. The lotion in the basket in the basket. Put the lotion dude, in the basket. these classics are timeless. Visit amberlive.tv to download your copy. Now with exclusive bonus tracks from the Amber Live Show. I'm Rusty Peen, and I do some of my best thinking when I've been drinking. Desert, and there is nowhere to go. So, I'm calling in now. <laughs> it's, it's five bucks. You can also name your own price. If it's only worth a dollar to you, sure. We'll take that. And... and, and <laughs> The sad but true part is that's real. You actually can go to amberlive.tv and get that album now. <laughs> it's a real album. All those songs oh, are so there. What, what, what's my take in this? What, what, what do I get? You get to keep doing your show. Oh, oh thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, no. Thank you. Russell, what are you? Russell, what a great show. Thank you so much that for putting was. that all together. Oh, my God. We had Julie. You know, we had a Grammy winner, a Tony uh, nominee, and just so much positive flow in the world tonight. And that, I think that's what we need. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, what, what do we have coming up next week, Russell? Next week is our uh, P-Town episode. And we will have the uh, Stephen, the new executive director of the Provincetown Business Guild, will be on chatting with you all about what's going on there this summer. And we uh, have uh, will be having a message from Miss Richfield, nineteen eighty one, and Miss Conception, and uh, some other guests. We're we're hoping if they don't have to uh, jet set off to L.A. for a a TV shoot. Uh, we are hoping to have uh, Madge and Biscuit with us um, because they're doing a show in P-Town this summer. So, you know, busy, busy, busy people. Um, and so that's next week. We'll be all about Provincetown. So you don't want to oh, miss how that No, no, no. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Russell. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great night. Yes. All right. Just want to repeat, happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Happy Juneteenth, you know. Let's celebrate Juneteenth as well. And uh, it's still Pride Month. Lots to celebrate. 
So I hope you celebrate in the best way possible. And that's it for tonight. We'll see you next week. Let's bring on Boog and Shug. You know what, Shug? No, what? I like Amber. You do? From a distance. <laughs> <laughs>